Good morning. Hello to all of you in the room. Hello to everyone online. It's good to be with you again for the second week of the Tood series. So for those of you who were not here last week, uh, just, keep, just a reminder, the entire series is on YouTube. The entire experience is on YouTube. Um, eventually, we'll get the sermons edited, and they'll be up on the, the Exponential Church webpage as well. Uh, but if you, have, if you missed last week and you need to get caught up a little bit, go ahead out to YouTube and you can look at uh, last week's message, or you can go back to the PATH series, because the PATH series really set the stage for where we are going with this series. So that being said, how many of you remember from the PATH series, what was, our, what was our phrase that we took out of that? Call it out, or write it in the chat. Go ahead. My direction, not my intentions, determines my destination. And we had the illustration, you get on 81 North, you're going to end up in Orleans, New York. Yes. So that's, I mean, and it doesn't matter. That's where that road goes. So your direction, not your intentions, determines my destination. And then last week we learned my attitude determines what? Condition. It's on the screen, so I know you can call it out. (laughs) There you go. My attitude determines the condition and the potential of my arrival. And we talked a little bit last week about the definition of attitude. Uh, We said that attitude is typically what we think about as attitude is a settled way of thinking that's usually reflected in how someone behaves. And then we talked about the alternate definition, orientation relative to the direction of travel. And we used the disc golf example. So you could see the, the discs going into the cage. And we talked about nose up versus nose down. Nose up was when I'm I'm thinking about me and and my motives are very clear, and I can be easily swayed in any direction because it's all about me, and so I'm easily pushed off of course. But if I'm nose down, I have a target in mind that it's irrespective of me, and we talked about what that target would be, right? Ultimately, the purpose of having uh, a, a good attitude or having a nose down attitude was that we are thinking always about God's good purpose in any circumstance, whether it's a circumstance that we alone are facing or a circumstance that we're helping someone else through. We're thinking about God's good purpose. And trying to help people, including ourselves, as we do that, realize what is truly best or truly good, truly right and pure. And so as we go through the rest of the series, we're going to be breaking down some of these, uh, some, some of the things that get in the way of us having an attitude that's focused on the right things. And then we're going to talk about some things that will help us keep a good attitude. So this week, we want to break down the attitude. So we, we, we said last week, the nose up, nose down was just sort of that first step of saying, okay, where, where's my orientation? What am I, what am I doing? Am I, am I kind of open to every opinion and think about myself or am I think about what God's good purpose is? Once we've dealt with that, I want to dig into where does our attitude come from, right? Because ultimately, this is, this is a key phrase for this week. Ready? Attitude determines altitude. Attitude determines altitude. And what do I mean by that? Well, there are some key things that go into shaping our attitude, and depending on how those things shape our attitude depends on how we're actually going to live out any circumstance. I'm going to give you a little bit of an illustration here. I brought some, I brought some things along just for fun because I'm going to turn this this way. Whoop. Ha-ha. All right. So attitude determines altitude. The three things that shape attitude are what I believe, what I keep, and who I trust. Okay? Remember those things. What I believe, what I keep, and who I trust. So let me give you a physical illustration of that. I've got some fun things here. And now, now I'll apologize in advance to those of you who are online because... There's only so far, we don't have like a follow cam or a boom cam, boom cam that, you know, can just watch it fly through the room. Although most of these, because they were made by me, will probably wind up right down here somewhere. So Tara, I'm sorry. You're probably going to get hit. Um, I'll talk. <laughs> you'll talk. <laughs> thank, thank you. But you, so the first piece of this is, um, these, these are the only ones I'm kind of fairly good at making, and that's a dart. Um, but all of us have a little bit of a different design. So if, if the plane itself is us, right? And, and we're thinking about attitude determines altitude. 
I mean, obviously, if I'm aimed like this, where am I going? I'm going straight down to the floor. Now, now there's some correctives, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but, but typically, if this is just straight plane, if I do that, and what's going to happen to the nose? You've all done it. You crash it, you're going you're gonna to crumple the nose, right? So let's, so boom, right down to the floor, right? Okay. So then we have, we have one that might go up. Woo, and that one's got a little bit of a loop-de-loo. And then, see, some of us are not just darts. You know, like that, see, that's like the achievers. The achievers are like, you know, they see something, away the they go. Then we have people that are a little bit more creative, um, a little bit, uh, you know, so you have maybe your engineers who get really jiggy with it, and they're like, hey, let's, let's do a square plane because square planes are cooler than triangles. Um, so we'll, we'll try this. Now, I have no idea what this is going to do. So fair warning to everybody. <laughs> Ooh, look at that. It actually flipped. So, and so the engineer goes, hey, I can figure out a way to get it to flip. It did not do that in practice, by the way. So I'm, I'm very, very happy. And then, and then there's like the super uber artistic engineers who are like, ooh, let's do this, you know. But, you know, some of us are just nonconformists. We don't look like an airplane, right? We, we just don't look like people, the way people expect us. Have you ever had that phone call with somebody where you've never seen them in person and you've got this idea of what they look like based on their voice? And then, you, and, and then you meet them in person and you go, ah, no. So some of us are like that, that we look, we look nothing like what people, and our attitude actually is nothing like what people might expect based on other things they see. But all that aside, um, we all fly a little bit differently, right? And that one's, eh, it, that one actually did better in practice. It, it went a little further. But the point is, We'll all have a natural way of flying based on our design. And then when you add into that what we believe about our design or what we believe about our circumstances or the place we're flying or how we're trying to fly, and then you, you start to add in other factors, it changes our ability to fly. It changes our ability for how we respond. So for example, when I said that's, this, this is a reflection, if I know how I'm designed and I believe, okay, I'm gonna fly a particular way, the little rectangular one who did the loop-de-loop, it's like, yeah, I can do loop-de-loops. I believe I can do loop-de-loops. For the dart, I believe I can achieve, Whew. right? But then you start talking about what we keep. Now, this plane is a dart. It has little flaps on the back that should help it, you know, go up a little bit. And when I flew this one at home, it, it would have made it all the way back there to Steve. I mean, it, it, it would go really nice. But I want to show you just a paper clip right? And before I add the paper clip, I want you to notice something else. Maybe you can't see this out, out there in the audience, ah, but maybe you can't see it as well, but there's staples, right? And how many of you know that when you make paper airplanes, whenever you add weight, you could change it, right? So these are added evenly and they serve a purpose. What's the purpose? Okay, what happens if the center of the plane opens up, right? It's a little harder for it to fly, right? It's not staying contained in its design. So the staples are there to just to hold it shut. It's positive weight. It's something to carry with it that's actually going to help it better do its function, right, which is to fly. But if I take weight that isn't designed to be a part of the plane, and I just kind of tag it on the back here, right? So there it is. You got just a paper clip. Doesn't take much. Barely made it off the stage. Nose up, stall. What we keep and what we carry with us is critically important to our attitude, which then is critically important to whether we reach our goal and the condition we reach our goals in. Just a little bit of weight that doesn't belong there makes a difference. Here's a plane of similar design to the one I just threw. Made it most of the way across the room. So what I believe is important, what I keep is important, and then who I trust. So sometimes you'll, you'll have an issue and you're trying to like, you know what, my plane isn't, isn't doing quite what I want it to. It's not quite that stable. And I want to try and just get it to fly a little bit further, a little bit better. I want it to balance out a little bit. And somebody will say, hey, you know what, put those nifty flaps up on the back. Or, or some people, put the flaps down. Well, if I put the flaps down, it's going to... And then you get those people that come out with some ideas and you're like, what is up with you? You know, and they'll say, well, tear the back and then pop this little thingy up in the back 
so that it'll fly. And, and it's really hard if you're not an, an aeronautical engineer to be like, okay, that sounds like good advice. You sound like you know what you're talking about. I wonder if it works. And you have a moment, right? Do I trust what I was just told or not? And depending on whether I trust it depends on what my attitude's going to be. Because remember the first definition of attitude, a set of beliefs typically demonstrated in someone's behavior. So if I allow something that I trust coming in from somebody else to influence what I believe, influence how I'm going to approach a situation, it's going to be reflected in how I fly. So if I take that advice, hey, cut the back end of the plane, tuck this little thingy up here, now do I want to try and fly it? And that's where the rubber meets the road for us, right? Sometimes we try it and it pays off short term. Sometimes we try it and it pays off and it's like, hey man, that's the best advice I ever had. It becomes a staple, right? It becomes something that we put into the body and we're like, yeah, we're going to build that into the design of everything we do. Sometimes we try it and it's, right? So just for fun, let's see what the little loop on the back does. Ready? I'm going to try and get to you, Rich. Oh, bounces it off the chair right into Rich's arms. Nice catch. <laughs> so when we look at that, what I believe, what I keep, and who I trust, there are three critical pieces that form my attitude. And we're going to go into Philippians 3 and see how Paul lines that up. When he's talking to the Philippians, he's trying to help them understand different pieces of this based on some circumstances they were dealing with. So I want to break those circumstances down and then help us sort of bring that, that application back to our life in each of those areas. So if you go with me to Philippians chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 1 through 6 first, and then I'll lay, the, I'll lay the context after I read it. Paul says, Further, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the same thing to you again, because he had written that earlier. It's a safeguard for you. Watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh, for it is we who are the circumcision we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee. As for zeal, I was persecuting the church. And as for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. So when you first read that, you go, okay, that's a lot. Let me simplify it and unpack it for you. As Paul was beginning to share the good news of what Jesus had knocked him off his horse for. So if you know the story of Paul, he was out persecuting Christians because he was a Pharisee. He was a Jewish leader who, he just gave you his resume. He was circumcised on the eighth day. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. Everything in Paul's life was done at the exact right time, in the exact right way for him to be a righteous religious person, right? There was no question. And anybody who would have questioned him would have stood in front of the law and gone, hmm, you know what? He's doing it all right. Paul, from a physical, fleshly, earthly bound circumstance, was perfect in regards to religious law. And he was out persecuting the early believers in Christ, in Jesus, because, the early followers of Jesus, because he believed they were a heresy. He believed there was no way that Jesus could be God. And so he was out condemning them and even giving approval as some of them were murdered. And then Paul, when he's on his, he was then called Saul, when he was on his way to Damascus, he gets knocked off his horse. And Jesus <laughs> says to him, why are you persecuting me? To which Paul goes, um, or he was then called Saul. Saul goes, um, who's speaking? Who are you, Lord? Which is an interesting response for, for, for Saul, later called Paul, to do. Because what that means is that moment, he just got knocked off his horse. He just got blinded. He recognizes that even though he doesn't know the voice that's speaking to him, that the voice that's speaking to him must have some amazing authority 
because here from an earthly perspective, he is the righteous dude. Like he is, he's, he's all that in a bag of chips. Like he is that religiously. And somebody just knocked him off his horse. So he's gone, okay, only one has that kind of power. So it's interesting. He responds to Jesus. Who are you, Lord? And Jesus answers and says, I I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And that's a transformational moment for Saul who then becomes Paul. God renames him and tells him about the mission that he's going to be on. So here Paul is in this mission of sharing the good news of who Jesus is and telling the story, sharing his story, sharing what has happened to Jesus why it means anything, why it makes a difference for the world. And he's writing letters to the early church. Well, while he's doing this, there were a group called Judaizers who were going around behind him. So every time he'd go on a missionary journey, there were a group that would follow behind and they'd be like, oh, oh yeah, so, so you've, you've decided to become followers of Jesus. Well, Jesus was Jewish. And in order to be a true follower of Jesus, you need to be circumcised and go through all of the religious rites of being a Jew. They were called Judaizers because they were basically trying to take someone from the issue of faith in Christ and put them back through the law. Now, it doesn't mean that because we follow Jesus, we ignore the law, right? It doesn't mean that because we follow Jesus that everything that God taught in the Ten Commandments is no longer relevant. No, Jesus came to empower us so we exceed the law. So the things that were necessary under the law are no longer necessary because we live beyond it, not because we have a free pass to ignore it. Does that make sense? But when it comes to the body and the flesh and having circumcision, for those of you who don't know what circumcision is, I'll just, I'll just briefly describe. It is, it is a, a practice where they take the foreskin off of the male genitalia. It is painful if you're an adult, not that I would know firsthand, it is painful, and in those days, you often would be like you would get a fever and you'd be you'd be uh, down for a couple of days until you're able to function again. If you were an adult who had it done, so what was happening? These Judaizers were coming through and saying, "Hey, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus, you need to be circumcised because there's no way for you to be a part of God's promise unless you are circumcised." So they're saying to all the people of the community, especially all the men, because the men were seen as representative of the household, that you need to be circumcised. Now, first of all, you, you got to be pretty convinced of who Jesus is. I'm just speaking as a guy here. You got to be pretty convinced of who Jesus is to be willing to go through that as an adult. But there were those who were so, so impacted by the truth of who Jesus is, the miracles that God was doing in and through Paul as, as the, the gospel message was spreading, that they heard these Judaizers and they thought, oh, well, they're telling, us, they're telling us similar stuff. It's all based on the same history, so it must be true. And so they were going ahead and doing it. And Paul says, whoa, whoa, time out. Philippians, do, stop. You Greeks who may not know any better, just, just stop. Yes, the history they're telling you is correct, but the application is not. And then he uses himself an example. He says, hey, you know, if, you're, if it's all about the flesh and you could somehow get a relationship with God and, and get into heaven by just mutilating your flesh, well, why wouldn't we just do that? That's far easier than trying to live a life where we actually follow a set of principles. And Paul's trying to help them understand their, being, their beliefs are being messed with. Because people are taking elements of truth and winding it together with elements of their own agenda. Elements of their own either misunderstanding or direct misdirection. And they wind it together because all of us know it's, it's easy for, easier for us to kind of sniff out an outright lie. But if you wrap that lie in the truth, it becomes a lot harder to disentangle. So Paul says, look, this is not about the flesh. 
If it was about the flesh, then I would have come to you as a Pharisee and I would try to all make you all Pharisees. But understand, I had this encounter where God knocked me off my horse and that, that's all meaningless. Like once you're in Christ, once you know Christ, you exceed the law. You don't have to go backwards and then try to pretend you're under the law. All the law was meant to do was to put you in a position where you would recognize the difference between what is right and what is wrong. What is God's standard and what is not? The law was designed to help you live a life set apart for God and to keep you sort of in that direction, keep that being your attitude, and help you recognize there were consequences if you went the other direction. That was the purpose of the law. That is still the purpose of the law that we have on our land, to help you know the difference between what is right and what is wrong. That's all it is. It doesn't save you. It doesn't kill you. It doesn't do anything. It just, it just tells you, hey, here's the standard. But your ability to live out that standard doesn't come from the law, and it doesn't even come from being a strict adherent of the law. Because you could adhere to the law 99.99999% of the time. But the minute you step across one of the laws, you are now a lawbreaker, correct? And it doesn't matter how much of the rest of the law you've kept, once you step across one part of the law, you're a lawbreaker. You're guilty. And you are deserving of the full punishment of that law. So Paul's trying to help them realize that. Like, look, don't let yourselves get mixed up in this and start believing that somehow changing your body or changing your flesh, changing your design is going to make you better situated with God. Which brings us to our very first point. What I believe determines how I engage. So you saw that with the airplanes, right? What I believe determines how I engage. If I believe that I'm an airplane that's going to do a loop-de-loo, I'm going to engage a little differently as I go in. I might start a little lower so that I can come up and around and not hit the ceiling, you know, or not you know, go too low and hit the floor. I want to just find that right spot. If I'm the circular one, I may have to spin a little, or I might have to go up a little and then just kind of coast my way down. If I'm the dart, it's straight out, baby. <laughs> What I believe determines how I engage. And with in Paul's situation, if you believe that you have to mutilate your flesh in order to have a better relationship with God, that skews everything that Jesus taught. Because if Jesus came and said, I am the sacrifice, I am the way and the truth and the life, I am the one you follow, he didn't go around saying, hey, by the way, you need to be circumcised. No, he came to exceed that law. He came to make it possible so that everybody who has a relationship with him could have a relationship with God. The reason this is important, what I believe is the first filter, okay? So why does, how does this impact our attitude? What I believe is the first filter. Whatever you believe about a circumstance, a situation, a person, your faith, whatever it is, what you believe is the very first filter that every circumstance and every bit of information that comes to you, that's the first filter it goes through. So, for example, if money is my highest goal and my, honey, my highest goal and, and achievement in life and all I want is money, then every decision I make is going to be in regard to what's going to make me the most profit, right? So the filter I'm going to have on every bit of information that comes in is, okay, so what's profitable in that, right? Make sense? If what I believe is that my coworker hates me, or a, or a fellow student hates me, then everything they say and do, even if it has nothing to do with me, they walk down the hallway not even looking at me and they move their body in a particular way. See, they hate me. It all gets filtered through what you believe. If I believe that my body is just a machine and that I exist apart from my body, then I'm going to have a real problem with the way my body works and I'm going to try and constantly separate myself from that. And, and there's, so there's something about human design, and, and biblically when you look at it, we are, we are body, mind, soul, and spirit, right? We've got all of these pieces that we'll use to describe us, right? But here's the simple principle. My soul and my mind, they're intimately connected to the flesh. I can't artificially separate them, right? To be a human is uniquely to have the, the material and the immaterial intertwined in a way that they cannot be separated. 
That's why even after we die, I mean, so, okay, so I'm going to take a break here. Those of you who are kicking the tires on your faith, you can just push pause for a second and wait and I'll come back. But, but I just want to speak this to those who already believe this, that if you believe that someday we're going to, to go and spend eternity with God, there's a reason why Scripture says it will, there will be a new heaven and a new earth, that will, be, that will be given new bodies. Why? Because the old will be transformed into the new, not done away with. That's significant. Because that is, that is God and the Bible validating that the material, God made us, not like the angels who don't have material bodies. God made us uniquely as souls who have material connected to them. So your design is what's in your body and, 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 and the soul that God gave you. But let me say it this way. I think this is a little bit better way to say it. The way that God intended you to be in and through your personality and your soul and your mind and what you think and everything, all your gifts and abilities, the body is the expression of that. Because there is not a single thing that God made in this world that does not have first his breath of life that then is expressed in the material. Think about that. The tree doesn't have the breath of life in the same way that we do. It simply is alive, right? But it, but it's but it's expressing its design in the very nature of how the cells function, right down to its DNA. A dog, a cat, they're expressing their design right down to their DNA. The genes that you have express who you are materially. And if I believe that my body is just a machine that I sort of inhabit, then, then I have a hard time with that. I'll struggle against it if I don't like my body, if I don't like something about my body, if my perception and my beliefs separate me from my design. And that's a really hard concept, but that's happening in our world, and it's not new. I want to tell you that this is actually a, a, something that was, <laughs> it was a philosophical concept a long, long time ago. Gnosticism was a heresy that believed that somehow there was this and Plato's thought, Platonic Gnosticism, not to get too deep here, but these were things that said there are ideals somewhere that exist out here in the ether, like the chair that's in front of me. There's an ideal chair that exists somewhere, right? And every other chair that's ever been manifested is just an expression of that chair, but it's completely separate, right? And if I wanted to be the best chair ever, I would try to achieve that secret knowledge. I would try to get beyond the material. Stoicism, ancient Greek Stoicism, believed to suppress the emotions, to suppress. Actually, when, when the Greeks heard about Jesus and the resurrection, they said to Paul, who? Because they thought Jesus and the resurrection were two separate people. In their thinking, the body and the, and the mind were separate, and so they saw no reason why you would have a body later. That if you were resurrected, they didn't understand that concept. There was no word for it. And Paul had to help them understand that. So all that to say that if we believe our bodies are just machines, it's going to determine the way I engage my life, the way I engage my gifts and abilities, the way I engage the culture around me. If I believe that I'm a victim, this one's easy, right? If I believe I'm a victim, then everything that happens to me is everybody else's fault. See, I don't even have to finish that one. If I believe I'm a victim, everything that's happened to me is everybody else's fault. If I believe there's no God, if I believe there's no God, then I actually engage every situation as if who's God? Me. If I believe there's no God, then I'm the God of my own circumstance. I'm the God of my own universe. I, I am the one who's in control of my destiny. See, what I believe determines how I engage. And the problem that we face most of the time, and just as normal human beings, I mean, without the philosophy and without getting too deep into the deep thinking there, the problem we most of the time face on a daily basis are ants. They're ants. Automatic negative thoughts. Things that as soon as we encounter something, it feeds back into, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not blah, 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 blah. Right? You name it. There is an accusation you have leveled against yourself somewhere. 
that has prevented you from reaching your full potential. Those are called ants. And, the, and uh, Dr. Dr. Daniel Amen, he's a psychologist. He wrote a book a while a while back called "Change Your Change Your Brain, Change Your Life." And one of the, one of the principles I found in his book that was that was really consistent and worthwhile was this concept of ants. And he said, "We've just got to squash the ants. You got to squash them as soon as you recognize an automatic negative thought. Squish it." But in order to squish an ant, you have to have a piece of truth to counter that automatic negative thought, right? Because I cannot take what I believe and course correct it against an ant unless I have that course correction. I need something to help me say, no, it's not whether I'm pretty enough or smart enough or fashionable enough or whatever or have enough money. or It's about I'm called to this and I, I can do this. And I'm supposed to do this. I will do my best. And maybe the thought beyond that is, God's called me to do this. God has empowered me to do this. And if I will simply step into it, even though I presently do not feel the ability to do so, even though I presently struggle with the belief that I can do this, God will give me the power to do it because he's called me here to do it. That's maybe second level for some of you. So we'll come back to that as we go throughout the series. But I just wanted to bring that out here that when we're talking about what I believe determines how I engage, we all have those automatic negative thoughts and we have to squash them or we're not going to be able to engage in the way that is best. Because remember, that's our goal. Can we get to God's good purpose in every circumstance and determine what is best? All right, so that's what I believe. What about what I keep? Paul goes on and he describes the Philippians. Look at verses 7 through 14. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider a loss for the sake of Jesus. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God is on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death so that somehow I can attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I've already obtained it or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind, straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Again, there's a lot there, but here's the simple, the simple pieces. My attitude in regard to what I keep, what I keep determines how well I endure. What I keep determines how well I endure. What Paul's talking about there is, is <laughs> he's trying to help the Philippians understand that it's not about mutilating the flesh. It's not about trying to alter the way that you are physically here is going to make you right with God. It's about understanding that having a relationship with him and so close a relationship that you are mimicking Christ, you're living according to him. Now, why is that important? Disciples. Paul knew as a Pharisee of Pharisees, as a religious person, he knew that a disciple didn't want to just do what his master did. A disciple wanted to be who his master was. And the disciples of Jesus, all of them, male and female, that's what they wanted. They want to be who Jesus is. And he says that is where the righteousness by faith comes from. By faith, trusting that Jesus is God, that he is the one we are to follow, and we give up everything that gets in the way of us being able to do that. So he says, look, I, I consider anything I have garbage compared to being able to hold on to that relationship, to hold on to being able to walk with him. And then he goes so far as to say, like a true disciple, I, would, I want to experience the death that he died so that I can experience the life that he lives. Because Paul knew that to be a follower 
of any rabbi, and particularly if it was Jesus who was Messiah, that he had to be just like him. So he's, he says, look, I'm willing. I'm willing to go through it. And if the reflection of Jesus' death is simply me giving up all my, my material stuff or all my stuff that I want and all my desires, so be it. Let me die so that I can live. Where's the lesson for us in that? What I keep can, determines whether I will endure. So this is, this is about baggage versus advantage, right? When Paul's talking about this, and in Paul's mind, he's trying to say ultimate discussion, right? Ultimate argument. Anything that we hold on to for this world is going to be a loss for us because that's a place where we didn't hold on to Jesus. Okay, that's what he's saying. And so he's willing to let go of it all and, and die to himself so that he can experience the life that God promised him through Christ. And he's going to continue to press on in that. So it's baggage versus advantage. I'm going to get real personal with you here for a second. You all know I have a big snoz, right? Schnoz, right? Right, this thing? right out in front. You know, it's a wonder when I turn sideways that they can even get it on camera because, you know, it's... <laughs> but see, when I was younger, I could, not have, I could not have laughed about that. You know why? Because every time I would get on the school bus, when I changed schools in second grade, there was a neighbor of mine older than me, a middle school boy, and we all know what middle school kids do, right? Middle school kids are brutal. They're absolutely mean. He would sit there, and I won't say his name because, you know, we're all grown up now, right? So, and it's not personal. I don't care anymore. But he would sit there, and he was like, your nose is so big. And he'd go, blah, 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 you know, like, like my, you know. And so I had this, like, oh, my word, you know, is it really that big? You know, and, and when you're in middle school, which I was still in elementary school, but you're in middle school, like, parts of your body grow different than other parts of your body. So you are out of proportion. I wasn't necessarily out of proportion, but yeah, it was a little big. And I had a choice, right? I could take that as baggage. That could be the paper clip on the back of my plane. Or I could be like, you know, that's just his opinion. That's an ant. I'm not going to accept that ant. Flash forward, when I'm in middle school, I'm a competitive figure skater. You probably, you know, if you've been in the Western culture at all for any length of time and through the 1980s, you would know that male figure skaters had a particular stereotype attached to them. Every, and I'm not talking like once in a while, I'm talking like every week in middle school, there was another story started by people who just wanted to pick on me. And they would make up things that they said happened in the locker room. And, these, and, so, like, and then it became this campaign. Like if I had interest in a girl, they would make sure she heard whatever that story was. And so I endured a couple of years of that in middle school of just brutal, brutal stories. Making fun of the fact that I must have been gay because I was a male figure skater. When, when honestly, I've got to tell you, I liked girls in kindergarten. Like, <laughs> like there, was, there was never a time for me that that switch was off, okay? <laughs> that switch was always on. My parents will tell you that. But, and, and you know, I'm not overcompensating. It's not homophobic. It's like, it's literally, that's always been the truth. And so as brutal as those stories were, and as much as it shook my thoughts about myself, that automatic negative thought, every time it would come, it was countered by realities around me. It was countered by beliefs and other things that I was carrying with me, like the staples in the airplane, that held it together. It wasn't easy, but in that I had a choice. Do I take it with me? Do I allow it to change what I believe? Do I allow it to take me in a direction that isn't where I'm supposed to go, but it's where I'm being pushed to go by what people are saying about me? Or do I simply stare it down and say, you know what? Whatever. And there were some days it was easy to say whatever. There are some days it was very, very hard to say whatever. One other dynamic. 
I have Native American roots. And being someone who comes from a, a local tribe that no longer exists. I grew up with the stories of understanding that part of my heritage. And I have a choice, right? I can buy into the stuff that says, oh, white people came and killed all the natives and they're awful and they're terrible. Or I can actually know the history. Human beings have done atrocious things to human beings for generations of all races, of all tribes, of all colors and all creeds. And we can never forget that. Because you know, the story of my tribe is one in particular where, yes, those who came and colonized had a dramatic impact and a devastating impact on the tribe. But my tribe doesn't exist, not because of white people. It doesn't exist because another tribe wiped it out. Humans have the capacity for violence, no matter which human it is. And if we fail to acknowledge the truth of that, then the accusations that divide us against each other get to stick, and we carry that with us. And we go into conversations where we recognize by visual inspection that somebody is different than us, and we start to let that play in the back of our head. And now everything they say is going through a set of beliefs that has been formed out of what we carry. And our attitude puts us on a crash course because now we have believed things about humanity in respect to race rather than in respect to all of humanity. We begin to see ourselves as tribalized individuals and victims rather than people who live with people. And so I like to be able to say, you know what, it doesn't matter the things that happened to me in the sense that I don't carry them, but I was able to take them from baggage to advantage. Because of those experiences, I can look at the situations in our culture and say, uh-uh, you don't get to blow smoke at me with that. That doesn't wash because humans are humans. People do bad things to people. It's not certain people do certain bad things to certain other people. People do bad things to people. Now, I'm not saying there isn't racism. Racism is real. It's a heart issue. It's not a political issue. It won't be solved by politics. It's only solved when we see each other as humans and we have compassion for one another's humanity. And if racism is done in front of us, we should call it out. There are laws to deal with it when it happens, and we should activate them. But we can't believe these broad brushes, that it's only happened here, and it's only happened there, and only this was done. Uh-uh. The Trail of Tears is real. The Cherokee were devastated by relocation. They're still devastated by being where they are in the, in the, in the zones that they're kept in and how poverty and everything and alcoholism has, has devastated certain tribes. That's a reality. It's one that we should be actively dealing with. And I, we have missionaries that are a part of this denomination that are down there every single day actively working to help them through that. Not politically trying to say all the things that you'll hear in the news, but to say, you're human. God values you. We can take the baggage or we can take the advantage. And how do we use that advantage then? Now, maybe some of you can't relate on that level, but I know most of you who are old enough to see MacGyver, uh, or maybe you've seen it on reruns, 
But let me just give this simple to you, because maybe some of you have never been in a situation where you've had to deal with somebody like getting in your face, although it's probably more common nowadays. You've probably never had to deal with that, but you still have situations that really stink. And they really feel like situations like, oh man, everything's falling apart. Well, I mean, one of the things I love about MacGyver, the show MacGyver, was it didn't matter what circumstance he was in. There was always something he could use, whether it was a fountain pen and duct tape to make a bomb, or, or you know, he diffused a, 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 a killer robot with a mirror. You know, it just, it didn't matter. He just always was willing to look at the situation a little differently and say, hmm, what do we do with it? There's a piece of that that I think Paul is encouraging the Philippians to understand. Lay down the baggage. Carry nothing that is temporal. Carry nothing that is only of this world forward. Carry only the lessons and the advantages that help you navigate this world better. Like the staples in the paper airplane. Carry only those things that help hold it together to accomplish the good purpose you were designed for. And then he moves to his last piece, which was important for us to have. Verses 15 through 21. All of us then who are mature should take a view of such things. And I'm going to stop, I'm going to pause right there for a second. Just like, I know that was heavy example, and I'm real tentative about giving positive examples as if I've somehow arrived. I just want to continue to remind you, like, the message is truer than the, than the life and the heart of the person who brings it. Spend five minutes with my family. They will tell you. And I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why that's important. So when I say all of us who are then mature, understanding I'm reading Paul's words, I'm not declaring myself mature. I'm still growing up. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. That if, I just want to tell you, this is a side note. If you ever get in an argument with somebody about theology or politics or whatever, that verse is so amazing. Just stamp that on your forehead, put it on your mirror, put it on your visor in your car, whatever it is. But anytime you get into a heated discussion, this is not agree to disagree. It's, it's understanding that you see it differently. And if God really wants to correct the way you're seeing it, he's gonna, right? <laughs> it's just, that's what Paul's saying. Like, if on some point you think differently, God will make it clear to you. That's Paul saying, hey, I'm giving you the best of what I got. You can believe me. You can trust me in what I'm telling you or not. But eventually, God will make it clear to you. That is, like for me, as, as somebody who's more of an achiever personality, that's huge. And I'll tell you in a minute why. Only let us live up to what we've already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I've often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. God bless you. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Brings us to our final point. Who I trust determines whether I excel. Now understand, when I say the word excel, I don't mean like, Ooh, you're going to be president someday, or whatever. I mean, whatever your goals. I'm not saying like celebrity, blah, blah, blah. I'm saying achieving the fullness of your purpose and design. Achieving the fullness of your purpose and design. Who I trust determines whether I excel. Have you ever heard the expression well-intentioned dragons? Anybody? Well-intentioned dragons? It's a very simple phrase, very simply, well-intentioned dragons still breathe fire. Now, you think about that for a second, think about what it might mean. There's lots of people who are going to speak into your life. 
There's lots of people who are going to come along and tell you what to do. There's lots of people who are going to tell you what they think. There are lots of people who are going to try and influence you. I had a colleague years ago who said, you know, I got all kinds of advertisements that they want to, they want to give me a drink and they want to do everything. They want, to, they want to sell me a new car. They want to make sure that I can go everywhere in style, but not a single one of them will save my soul. 100% of the media that we consume and the advertising that we see is all about gratifying something we really don't need, but none of it is about our soul. Not a single ad is about your soul. Well-intentioned dragons still breathe fire. When people speak into your life, even with good intentions, sometimes what they're telling you should not be trusted, should not be followed, because it may just be fire. It may just be control. Celebrities. You don't really know celebrities. No matter how much they have a voice, no matter how much they've come into your television set and into your living room or your phone or whatever, they don't know you and you don't know them. They've never lived your life. You've never lived theirs. You don't know who they are when the cameras are off. You only see what they want you to see. Experts. Experts are great, but experts have typically a singular focus. Why has this whole thing around the pandemic been so contentious and why do people love Fauci and hate Fauci? And I don't care what your opinion on Fauci is. He's an expert. Experts have one focus. And I, think, I seem to recall he even said that way back in the early of the pandemic, back in February, March of last year. He said, my concern is around the health concerns. Others are going to deal with the politics and the, and the governance and blah, blah, blah. My concern. Now, I don't care what you think as far as how he's done his track record, and I'm not advocating him. I'm just pointing out he's considered an expert. So everything he gives you is going to be from a safetyist standpoint when it comes to health. It's not meant to be a commentary on economics. It's not meant to be a commentary or a roadmap for how we govern ourselves and whether we mask or unmask or socially distance here as things settle. Others have to speak into that policy. Leaders. Leaders. This is one of the reasons why I said this at the beginning of the series, that the, that the message is much truer than the one who delivers it. We, we can never be in a place or realize that leaders, anybody who has the opportunity to lead other people, always, always has the temptation for power and control. Some set it aside very well. Some don't. And on any given day, any leader can fail. Any leader can fail. I will tell you as an achiever myself, <laughs> it's funny when you know things about yourself and then you don't take care of it. I'm somebody who's an achiever. Like, it's, it's going to go in this direction, right? Now, when I was younger and I was in that place where I was being picked on and I was, you know, I did feel small and I did feel like, you know, there was all this stuff and life was bigger than me. The world was bigger than me. I couldn't handle the things that were coming at me on a daily basis. That was when I met God and in meeting God there, I had this understanding like I need to rely on him. I need to trust him. I need to have him be the power and strength by which I focus. And that's why the verse, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me became such a, a, a keystone for me and why I would try anything. Like, I had no fear to try it. And it was a verse that carried me through some of those years where I was just totally small and put down. But I'm human. And when you get to a point where you feel like you've gotten past some of that, and then you have these areas that you are responsible for, being a father, being somebody who handles a lot of responsibility at work, being a teacher, it's very easy to go to default behaviors. My default behavior is when chaos hits, I'm an, I'm a, <laughs> I'm an advisor influencer. That's my core gift set. So what does that mean? I'm going to try and get it under control. I'm going to try and get my arms around it and move it in the direction it needs to. That's me. It's always been me. 
But as I've gotten older and I've gotten a position where I don't feel like I have to pull back and trust God to move things, I try to get it. And when I try to get it, the more I try to get my arms around it, what do you think happens? The, the, the more it slips away, the more frustrated I get, which then means I try even harder. I mean, so I, the control freaks in the audience, thank you very much. You're the ones like, <laughs> because you know, the more you try to get a hold of it, it just gets away from you. And then comes anger, right? Those are the things we have to realize. When we look at leaders, leaders are just people. And more often than not, you're going to see leaders who are achievers, leaders who are tempted by power, they're tempted by control, they're tempted by their influence. And we have to pull back and say, you know what? I'm not in control. The only time I'm healthy, truly healthy and free, is when I'm in a place where I'm like, you know what? There's nothing I can do about that. Nothing I can do about that. That's, the, that's one of the healthiest places for me to be. It's not laziness. That, for me, is health. For others, that would be laziness. But for me, that's a good place for me to be. Because that's a place where I'm saying God's in control. How about friends? Are your friends invested in you because of his good purpose in your life? Or are they invested in you because of what they get from you? And then what about God? Am I willing to take God at his word? Do I trust him? Because if what I believe about him, and if what I keep from experiences that I've had with him are advantage, and then I'm willing to trust him, what's that going to do? What am I going to see happen in my life? I don't know for you. I know part of the journey for me. Maybe you have been kicking the tires on this, on this thing called Christianity. Or better yet, following Jesus. Then you have to, you know, at least come to this and say, okay, if my attitude, if I'm having trouble with this whole thing with attitude, what do I believe? What am I keeping? What am I, who am I trusting? And if I'm willing to open that door to believe God, to accept the advantages that he has promised me and to trust his word, and to trust him. How's that going to shift my life? Because I come face to face on a daily basis that not only does my direction, not my intentions determine my destination, but my attitude determines the condition and the potential of my arrival. It's critically important that we settle what we believe what we keep, and who we trust so that we can get our attitude set and truly fly. God's made you to fly for a particular purpose in this life. Now, I'm going to encourage you this week to think through that. Every time you come into a situation, start thinking, what do I believe? What's the filter I'm using as I'm looking at this situation? What am I keeping? How am I responding to things that I've held on to that maybe is causing me to respond poorly to this situation? And then who do I trust as far as the advice or the solution or what have you? Actively work through that. It's super hard to do when you're in the midst of intense situations, but it's so worth it if you take the beat, if you take the breath and you do it. So that's my encouragement to you this week is do that. I'm inviting you next week to come back because all of this about attitude begs a question. Okay, is there an attitude that God says, if we're willing to take him at his word, is there an attitude that God says is, should be my default attitude? Because is there an attitude that's going to just smooth some of this over, make it a little bit easier for me to take that beat, pump the brakes and go, what do I believe? What am I keeping? Who am I trusting? As I go into the situation, how am I, am I nose up, nose down? Like what's going on here? How am I entering this situation? Is there a default attitude that God says, if you just let me help you have this, it will make the rest of this a bit easier? My answer to you is yes, but you've got to come next week to find that out. <laughs> Tune in next week to find out. So, <laughs> Thanks, Zachary. <laughs> All right. So let's, let's pray together. Father, thank you so much. 
for allowing us to go into something that is not easy for most of us to get a handle on on a daily basis. Moment to moment, this is the hardest thing for any of us to deal with because it's deeply personal. It's, it's instantaneous. It's a without thought kind of action that happens in our life and kind of mechanism that happens in and through us. And yet you call us, God, to pull back and give it thought. Pull back and really look at what is the basis and the nature of why we do what we do and why we respond the way that we do and who we listen to and why do we trust the people that we trust. God, all of those things get called into question when we come face to face with you. Because when we stand before you one day, we're not going to be able to say to you, well, I'm sorry my life was messed up, God, let me into heaven, because Bob told me so. We get that, God. So I'm asking, Father, as we continue through this, this week, would you give us all a consciousness and an awareness to pump the brakes, take that beat, and think through, what am I believing? What, what am I holding on to? Or what have I carried into this? And who am I trusting? And then, Lord, in that moment, lead us by your Holy Spirit into all wisdom and truth so that we can know, as we talked about last week, what Paul said, what is truly best. And we can come with a pure heart in order to do the highest good that you've intended. God, we praise you and we thank you. And we trust you to lead and guide us through the rest of this series. In Jesus' name, amen.